I've recently sinned and gave some advice to a pharmaceutical about a new drug for that heart eye disease. So I'm uh, obliged to declare my conflict of interest, potentially. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some new treatments. Um, I'm also going to go a little bit back in history because I think it's fun. And uh, I'm going to be somewhat controversial and outrageous. And probably you have to do quite a bit of editing at the end <laughs> since this is being recorded. <laughs> so Simon has referred to treatments and uh, these are treatments <laughs> that we still use today. and They've been around for an awful long time. And back in 1992, I was a research fellow here in Newcastle doing some work in the labs about thyroid eye disease. And we had a visitation by Sally Mitchell. Who's Sally Mitchell? Does anyone know? You do. Simon does. OK, so Sally Mitchell was the founder of TED CT. Um, and she founded it at the beginning of the 1990s. Uh, quite a fierce lady who obviously had thyroid eye disease. And she came to visit us because she knew that we had an interest in thyroid eye disease. We were doing some research and we had a clinic. And uh, she came and uh, came right up to me and said, your treatments are rubbish, they don't work, they make patients terrible, what are you doing about it? And I don't think I've felt such a sense of urgency and guilt in my entire life just um, talking to, to Sally. So, um, this has ceased to work for some reason. So what's happened between Sally's visit and now? Uh, if she was around, she'd probably say FA. Just two new drugs that have been added to our list. Uh, rituximab and selenium, and both of those Simon made reference to. But what we do have is uh, a whole list of potential treatments that are smart because they target specific parts of the immune system and they've been used in other autoimmune diseases with some success. And there's also at least another seven very interesting compounds that seem to work in cultures and in vitro, but they haven't been tested in humans. What we also have is still, in the 21st century, a lot of unmet needs of patients with TED. And so there was, this is a survey that uh, was done some years ago showing exactly that. that lots of patients did not feel the treatment was uh, sufficiently good. And uh, more recently, in 2014, there was a patient event in London. And again, the same theme came out. So we're still having these unmet needs of patients. And certainly in the UK, you, the patient group, are very keen to get involved in research and engage in science on TED. And we had a very good meeting here in Newcastle back in 2014 where you, the patients, came up with some really good ideas about research. So I think we've got the ingredients to crack this conundrum, what causes thyroid eye disease, and finding some really good treatments. And knowing about what causes is actually absolutely key. There's a missing link, though. What do you think it is? There's no dosh. And, uh, and this is important. And I sat down and tried to, to estimate how much would it cost to really get to the bottom, find out what causes it, and try all these treatments and find something new. And it's kind of the equivalent of any one of these. <laughs> now, I'm making an assumption so far that we're talking about treatments that are based on scientific evidence. Because out there, there is another dark world the world of alternative medicine. And this is just one of the websites that you might come across if you're newly diagnosed with thyroid eye disease and you're looking 
for various treatments and uh, in this particular case the treatment consists of this concoction which includes raw eggs and so how much do you think we in the UK spend on alternative treatments any guesses Um, four and a half billion per annum. Now, the, these are data that come from this market research survey. They're a bit old. Um, the other interesting fact is that 50% growth in alternative medicine in the last five years. And back in 2009, alternative practitioners outnumbered GPs. The one good thing about austerity is that the NHS no longer spends 500 million per annum outsourcing services for alternative medicine. Okay, so I'm going to move on to <laughs> something less controversial perhaps. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the early history of thyroid eye disease. The first text that has been unearthed about thyroid eye disease was during the reign of the Byzantine Emperor Leon VI, the wise. And uh, this was a legislation text and uh, it was about employment and it went like this. Η γη σε στήνω μέγα περί των λαμών έχουν καριών και τους οθαλμούς έχουν προκύπτοντας. I suppose you want a translation, eh? So the man who has a great walnut around the neck and bulging eyes is considered as healthy. So, <laughs> so if you think the Department of Works and Pensions is a little bit hard on people with thyroid eye disease, <laughs> try the Byzantines. You could not get a sickie out of them for thyroid eye disease. So this is 8th and 9th century um, AD. And then there's, there's a lot of claims about the first case ever depicted in, in art. And uh, here's one of the early ones. The, the Ptolemies were descendants of Alexander the Great and took over his empire. And it is said that thyroid eye disease and Graves disease run in their family. And perhaps you can see the hint of a goiter and bulging eyes in one of the Ptolemies. The emperor um, Maximinus Dyer was also thought to have had Graves' disease and thyroid eye disease, and I think you can see just looking at his eyes, perhaps there is justification in thinking that that might be the case. And uh, this lovely drawing by Leonardo is meant to show somebody with thyroid eye disease, prominent eyes, and maybe a hint of a goiter. And this uh, painting from Gustav Dorr, He's showing the ogre um, slaying the babies, and he is, has been suggested that he had thyroid eye disease and actually myxedema, hypothyroidism, which made him mad and attacked the babies, and also rather big. So I just wanted to bring you up to the 19th century because um, very shortly afterwards was this publication that appeared in the literature. So Dr. Daniel Brower of Chicago, Illinois, reported the treatment of exothyroidia by a tincture of strophanthus and claimed that strophanthus tincture made patients better, including their eyes. So um, strophanthus is this lovely blossom. It comes from a plant from South Africa, I believe, and I'm, I'm sure Peter put me right on this. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask someone, Simon, what do you think of this claim? Strophanthus, would you use strophanthus in a thyroid eye clinic? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, you, you wouldn't necessarily know that uh, using a fox stuff is good for heart failure. So, so I, I would be neutral and say I don't know enough about the medicine and chemistry of strophanthus to know. Okay. So, so I think this was the first case report of a treatment for thyroid eye disease. And uh, 
what is contained in Strophanthus is warbane, which is rather similar to what is in flock, foxglove, um, a drug called digoxin. And I think this was being used actually up, up until a few decades ago as a treatment for heart failure for slowing down the heart. And digoxin is still being used and some patients with Graves' disease get a fast heart rate and irregular heart rate and we still use it. So it's, it's, it's not that far-fetched for the heart, um, but doesn't do anything to the eyes. And I think uh, Simon has demonstrated one of the most important qualities for a scientist to be a skeptic and not believe everything that you read. And you really have to ask when these claims come up for new treatments, and we see them a lot in the media, where is the evidence and does it really make mechanistic sense that this compound does something. And so from 1992, from Sally Mitchell's visitation to now, there's a whole list of drugs that have come up and people have claimed, like Strophanthus, that they work for thyroid eye disease. And these are largely single case reports and small observational series and uh, over time they've been designated to the dustbin of history um, because they don't work. And the question is why? Why do we have this sort of these hopes, these claims coming up that they work and they come from, from reliable sources, you know, from, from respectable clinicians. Um, and the answer is what Simon referred to earlier on, Rundle's curve. So Rundle, Francis Felix, is this man who was born in Newcastle, Australia, and he came to the UK in the 1930s, 40s, and, uh, and worked in London. And what he did, because there weren't any effective treatments for thyroid eye disease, he was observing patients and just plotting what happened to them if left untreated. And you got this, this curve. The disease starts off, gets progressively worse, reaches a peak, and then starts getting better again. And I'd like to draw your attention to this part of the curve where if you do nothing, it does get better. It takes time, but it does get better. And if you introduce your treatment, whatever it might be, at that particular time, and it takes time from the diagnosis until patients come to see the doctor, then what you'll observe is an improvement. You can substitute that with anything you like, including alternative treatments, and you can claim that your treatment has worked. And I think this is really uh, how I would explain why alternative medicine is so successful because most human elements are actually self-limiting and if you give a sympathetic ear plus a placebo plus it's a bit of time then you get the result um, and if people think it helps why not well i think why not because it costs and may prevent some people from receiving treatments that they really need 2006 i think was an important year for thyroid eye disease because this was the first time that somebody uh, reported, this is from Denmark, um, reported the use of a new drug, a new, whole new class of drug, uh, rituximab that Simon referred to before. And so this was a study not intended for thyroid eye disease. It was, they were looking to see what this drug did to patients with Graves', Graves disease for the overactivity. And they made an observation that it actually seemed to do something to the eyes. And we call this class of drugs biologics. They seem to target very specifically parts of the immune system. And certainly in rheumatoid arthritis and other diseases, they've been really very successful. And uh, when we used it, one of our first cases who wasn't doing very well on steroids, um, I think, Simon, you, you were the first one to use it. But there were really spectacular results over a very short period of time that we really had never seen before. And, uh, and Anna published this and together with some of our other uh, experiences. 
So between 2006 and 2014, there are lots of interest in this compound, uh, at least 80 publications case reports, observation studies, case control studies. Um, and then 2015, what everyone was waiting for, two independent randomized controlled trials looking at this were published around about the same time. And so one was from Milan, the other one from the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. The Milan study compared rituximab against steroids, the one from Rochester against placebo. And one showed that it works very well, the other one showed that it doesn't. And um, we've really been thinking about this an awful lot recently. And uh, we think this is because the numbers were small, there were single center studies, and most importantly, the duration of the disease. And this again is about Rundle's curve. We think the fact that the Milan patients were being treated very early, within four to six months of the onset of the eye disease, uh, that it probably explains why the response was, was good. Whereas the study from the Mayo patients had a much longer duration of disease. So where are we with that? Um, I think based on the evidence that, that exists, um, we think it probably does work in thyroid eye disease, but what we need is a large study which is properly um, resourced and properly conducted that can actually answer this question once and for all. Again, I'm sorry I'm repeating some of the things that have been said before. Selenium is, again, a relatively new treatment. The evidence came out in 2011 for patients with mild active disease. And this has been shown very nicely in that very large study. Six months of selenium seems to make a, a significant difference. Um, but there is no confirmatory study. And ideally, you want two independent randomized controlled trials pointing the same direction to be really confident that something does work. Another one that uh, has appeared recently is this drug, tocilizumab. This is another one of these smart drugs used for rheumatoids. And we've had some case reports and a single observational study from Spain, which really looked very, very interesting, very spectacular, I would say. And one of the things that doesn't change very much with medical treatments is the, what we call the proptosis, the bulging of the eyes. So the medical treatments that we have usually do something to the inflammation. They may improve the double vision, but setting the eyes back, they tend to be rather disappointing. And we do rely on our surgeons to, to pick it up and put it right afterwards. With this drug, the, the preliminary data showed a really big effect in proptosis, the eyes going back. And the same group in, in Spain have carried on a randomized control trial with the same agent, We're waiting for the results that haven't come out yet. And it's, it's a little while since it was completed, so really not sure what that's going to show. There are two studies which have been completed and we expect the results to come out this year. One is from the Ugogo group, combining steroids with that other drug, mycophenolate, which is used for uh, transplant rejection for some other inflammatory diseases. Um, very large study, 150 odd patients. And we, we think that we might see something interesting when it gets published, but it isn't out yet. And then CERTIT is a, it's a UK-based study, which actually took a long time to complete. It goes back quite a while. It hasn't been an easy one. And it's looked at drugs that have been around for a very long time, nothing, nothing new. So it's radiotherapy, azathioprine, and, and uh, steroids, combining them. And again, we'll find out later on this year whether this gives us some additional options. 
So this is a real mouthful, teprotumumab. And this is the really new kid in the block. Um, the history of this is really fascinating. It's um, one of these smart drugs. It's a monoclonal antibody. It was developed initially as an anti-cancer drug. And there are good theoretical reasons why it might be active in cancer. It took millions to develop it, to try it out, and it was a complete disappointment. It did absolutely nothing to cancer patients. So it was shelled for a while, and then somebody came along and read the literature on thyroid eye disease and found that what this targets is something which we think may be related with the um, mechanism of disease in thyroid eye disease and raised the money to conduct a randomized control trial in the US. And it's recruited a lot of patients, 150 odd patients. It's a multi-center randomized controlled and it is due to be published in the New England Journal of Medicine. That is the most highly rated clinical journal and uh, we, we expect that this will show something really very different to anything that we've seen before. So there's, there's a lot of anticipation that relates to this agent. There are other studies that are ongoing. Um, there's a study of selenium in Graves' disease. Um, this is going on in uh, Denmark. So not just patients who've developed thyroid eye disease, but those who are at risk. And this, if you like, is potentially is a preventive treatment. Um, Simon here in Newcastle is involved in a really fascinating study trying to, if you like, desensitize patients with Graves' disease and switch the disease off. And if that works for Graves' disease for the over th overactive thyroid, it may also work for the eyes. There's a monoclonal antibody that was developed against the TSH receptor and that is also undergoing some trials and there may be spin-offs that relate to thyroid eye disease. There's another monoclonal antibody, again, some theoretical reasons why it might work in thyroid eye disease, and that study has been carried out in Italy. So the, the other thing that has happened in the last few years is that uh, we now seem to have a good animal model for Gray's ophthalmopathy and uh, this has been uh, uh, published it's been reproduced in more than all laboratories these mice can be immunized with the TSH receptor and they produce antibodies and some of the mice develop thyroid eye disease you can see here the inflammation around the eye now that what that means is that you can study this disease much more in detail and easier in an animal model and see what happens as the disease progresses and try to tease out what are the events that lead up to the disease. It also means that you can actually try various drugs in an animal model and see if they work before you try them in humans. So I think this has been a, a very significant um, uh, progress. So, um, what does the future look like? Um, I think it looks good. We've got uh, clinical trials that are going to be completed and report in 2017, three of them. There are four ongoing clinical trials. We've got lots of promising compounds that are already licensed and used in human beings for other diseases that could work in thyroid eye disease and some very promising preclinical compounds. Funding is a problem and traditionally it comes from government sources that's becoming more and more difficult. Uh, the UK had a very good deal for research out of the EU and with Brexit that's going to be lost. We do rely a lot about uh, from uh, money on, from from charities and the Diago study that 
Anna is conducting now is being funded by charity, but again, those organizations are struggling. The pharmaceutical industry is beginning to get interested in thyroid eye disease. I think that's, that's encouraging. So, overall, I would say that the future looks more like a Northumbrian sky rather than a Mediterranean sky. And um, going back to funding, I think we spent four and a half billion on alternative medicines. If the Chancellor were to impose, say, a 1% levy on that, we could hand that money to Anna, and within a record time, she would become professor, and within 10 years, she would have all the answers for what causes thyroid eye disease and what are the best treatments. So it's all up to you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>